Hi everyone and welcome to my review of 2023. This will probably be my last video of the year. I might do a, a video yet on uh, some of the film books I've been reading recently and then probably January 1st or uh, I'll do a video on um, what to expect uh, out of this channel for 2024 for anybody who might be interested in. So this review of 2023 is going to be about surprises. I love to be, I don't know about you, but I love to be surprised when I see a movie. I don't have the greatest expectations of it. I saw it years ago, can't remember much about it, don't, don't remember being particularly entertained or absorbed by. Um, and then you, I see it now and, and I'm like, wow, this was really a terrific movie. <laughs> and uh, so I could have done favorites, I could have done, uh, you know, the greatest films I saw in 2023. Now, none of these films were released in 2023 because I have not, I have not seen as far as I, 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 I can recall. I don't think I've seen one film yet uh, that's been released in 2023. So if you have any surprises, movies that really surprised you, I'd love to hear um, what those uh, that you watch in 2023. I'd love to hear what they might be. Um, so we're going to go in chronological order by the the theatrical releases of these films. So we're going to go back what, 104 years and we'll go to 1919's The Doll. And this is actually a double feature. We also get I Don't Want to Be a Man, uh, also 1919, both directed by the great Ernst Lubitsch. I don't know why I was particularly surprised by this one thing. I'm not a uh, silent film aficionado, but Ernst Lubitsch is in my personal pantheon of film directors, and I was still stunned by the uh, the relevance of both of these movies. There's because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be a man. Really confronts gender issues, uh, which a woman dresses up as a man because she thinks men have all the privileges in life. But the doll is like a, a a sort of fairy tale farce, and both these movies star Ossi Osvaldo, uh, actor, silent film, German silent film actress, the comic actress that I had never heard of before. But she is absolutely sensational in the doll and in both the films, but particularly in the doll, because it's a very difficult role where she has to be a a. Uh, a life-size doll, so she has to do all the kind of uh, robotic movements that a doll would make, and also play the woman that this doll was based on. So in some scenes, she has to alternate back and forth between being the doll and being who she really is, and a great um, uh, masquerade, and uh, it, it's just, it's absolutely hilarious movie from Ernst Lubitsch before, this is German film, before Ernst Lubitsch came to uh, Hollywood. I will go to 1933, this is Counselor at Law, so we get a pre-code gem here, starring the great John Barrymore, big star in silent films, and definitely on stage as well, uh, but um, this is this may be, I haven't seen all his performances in the talkies, but this may be his best talkie performance. Uh, alcoholism was, was really uh, uh, deteriorating, especially his memory. They had, uh, the director, William Wilder, had to have cue cards uh, assembled, and so everywhere Barrymore looked, he knew what his lines were because he was unable to, um, to read his lines anymore which is truly amazing. You would never know that when you watch the movie because Barrymore is great. Uh, it's an early William Wilder film that, uh, based on a stage play, he did, that William Wilder does not open up this stage play. It's, it's, it's played in a group of offices of lawyers and uh, it's cinematically terrific. And I was stunned by how cinematic that William Wilder could make this stage play, which in other hands would be static and talky, which led me to do three uh, videos on uh, Wilder films from the 1950s, The Heiress and uh, Detective Story of Desperate Hours. And there's more William Wilder to come because I'm really rediscovering him. Uh, he's He won 11, 12, or he got 11 or 12 uh, Academy Award nominations for Best Director. I think that's the most of all time. I think he won three times. Um, 
but he's not really uh, up there with uh, some of the great uh, filmmakers. He's, at least he doesn't seem to be remembered as much. And so I'm going to do my best in 2024 to uh, uh, to uh, renew interest in William Wilde, the film director. And so now we come to uh, a director, another director who is in my personal pantheon. Now those two were keynote releases of 2023. Um, this film is from Warner Archives. This was released uh, several years ago. This is Alfred Hitchcock's I Confess from 1953, starring Montgomery Clift. And it is a film that I had seen in a long time. It was never one of my favorite Alfred Hitchcock films, but I just, I was just uh, stunned by how this movie affected me. Montgomery Cliff playing a priest who uh, adheres to the, to his code that, that the, um, his religious belief that the, uh, uh, the confession is sacred. He hears who the killer is in that confession, but he refuses to uh, tell the police about it. He becomes the chief suspect himself, and he gradually realizes that this dilemma is tearing him apart. And he, there's a great scene here where he faces off against the, the killer, and we get the sense of good and evil that, that so obsessed Hitchcock in, in, in so many of his films. And I did two other Hitchcock films, including Shadow of a Doubt this year. Shadow of a Doubt was about a favorite uncle and his favorite niece, also representing good and evil, uh, and they they have a similar kind of face-off. That's a family where good and where evil exists within a family. Uh, and there's another great scene here where the detective played by Carl Malden. There's a moment of realization here when Carl Malden figures out what this priest has put himself through, and even though. Uh, Hitchcock is the master of suspense. He could get great performances out of actors, even method actors like Montgomery Clift, who would torment Hitchcock with, uh, when Hitchcock says, look up at that window, and Montgomery Clift told him, why would I look up at that window? I don't think I would, what's my motivation for looking up at that window? Despite that, <laughs> Montgomery Clift, this is one of Clift's greatest performances in 1953. And then we'll move on to 62. This is the trial. This is only one of two criterions I have uh, uh, on this list. And uh, this, this is released uh, in 2023 in 4K. It looks absolutely fantastic. It's based on a Franz Kafka novel. I rewatched the movie, which I hadn't seen in a long time, and then I reread the book, which I hadn't read in a long time. And it was a great experience. This is it was so it's so rewarding, and uh, Orson Welles, would, the director of this film, uh, he would um, he would sometimes say this is his favorite film. He think or he thinks this is his best film, and he also said something really interesting, where he said that he believed that this is less an adaptation of Kafka and more of a conversation with Kafka, in confronting the existential despair of the of the 20th century, and. And uh, and Wells is uh, uh, you know each every scene in a Wells movie is just so compelling in in, in the way it's uh, uh, the way it's uh, framed set up. He had some great locations here in the trial, um, and and he does stick very close to the book. In fact, I would say ninety five percent of the movie, maybe even more, is is in the book. He's very faithful. He even uses some of the dialogue that Kafka uses. Okay, let's go on to 1969. This is three and the two won't go. I was really looking forward to this movie, but I thought I would be disappointed because this is, by modern sensibilities, perhaps a, a little problematic. It doesn't cast judgments on its characters. A, a teenager, hitch, teenage hitchhiker, gets picked up by a traveling salesman, Judy Deason. T uh, the teenage hitchhiker and Rod Steiger, the businessman. Uh, he's he's sort of a serial philanderer you know, when he's on his travels, and uh, but he gets his comeuppance in this movie because Judy Geeson, as he goes on subsequent trips, he comes home one day and here's Judy Geeson at his home with Claire Bloom. Uh, 
Judy Gieson is not told about the, about the romance, but we now have a triangle, a very dramatic triangle, brilliantly directed by Peter Hall. Uh, Rod Steiger is, is at his uh, most restrained, and I was in Judy Gieson, and he had uh, some really good scenes here, and dare I say it, Judy Gieson outacts Rod Steiger. Can that be? <laughs> Let's go on to uh, 1975, Francois Truffaut's The Story of Adele H. And this is uh, um, a movie that I liked when I saw it in 1975. I absolutely was bowled over by it this time. And much of that is due to Isabella Johnny's really great performance. It's one of the great performances of, of the very peculiar films of the 1970s. Adele H is the daughter of Vic Victor Hugo great novelist, the most famous man in the world during the, uh, the setting of this story. Uh, and his daughter has gone lovesick for a uh, officer who her father does not approve of. And she goes across the ocean and to Canada and beyond, chasing down this officer who doesn't want anything to do with her. It's just a total obsessive, a total delusion. Pauline Kael called it one of the great films of the 1970s with one of the great performances. I, I totally agreed now with, uh, with her, uh, her uh, review of this film. And, and uh, this is another uh, Kino release, and they released what, six other films uh, from Truffaut that have not come to Blu-ray in the U.S. before. Uh, a four-film box set without any uh, supplements, but the films are... are are good enough. You don't need any supplements on those four Truffaut films. And then they did Mississippi Mermaid and The Bride Wore Black as single titles, which I had uh, previously done videos on. And Truffaut is, is, is known today almost entirely for The 400 Blows, his first film. But there's a lot more to discover in, in, in Truffaut. 1977, this is probably my biggest surprise of the year. I had no expectations that this would be something I liked. Haunting of Julia, directed by Richard Loncrain, even though she's not on the cover here, uh, this is a Mia Farrow movie. And this is really Mia Farrow in her sort of Rosemary's Baby uh, uh, mold. Um, she's, she's frail, she's soft-spoken, um, but there's secrets going on here. This is a ghost story, it's a, it's a, um, it's a eerie, uh, Tremendous suspense. Uh, Mia Farrow didn't want to make this movie because she thought she was being typecast in these kinds of roles. She is just absolutely terrific in this movie. Mia Farrow during the six Rosemary's Baby and on through the 70s, she just was, uh, just gave some fantastic performances, uh, including Secret Ceremony. Uh, there's a few more as well. This has a uh, has a uh, commentary with the director, recent uh, uh, commentary uh, with uh, Simon Fitzjohn, who is one of the impetuses behind the uh, restoration of The Haunting of Julia. It's a really good commentary because Richard Longcrane doesn't think much of this movie. <laughs> you don't often get that in co director commentaries. Uh, in fact, Simon Fitzjohn has to keep convincing him all through the film, no, this is a good movie, this is a good movie. He says, oh, people, oh, I guess it's great that people like it, but what, what do they like about it? I should have done this, I should have done that kind of thing. Uh, he was very disappointed, but in Dolby Vision, this is probably the best film 4K I saw in Dolby Vision because it's very dark, Dolby Vision, very good at, at dark scenes. And it, it really is a... A haunting movie. Um, and then we have uh, another we, uh, Kino release that was Scream Factory. This was, a, uh, well, it's actually a Cohen Media release. Uh, they released four Jacques Rivette films in 2023, and hats off to them for doing that. Um, and I think this is my favorite of the four Secret Defense, and this stars Sandrine Bonaire. It's a very long movie. But you could say this is uh, Rivette's thriller. You could even say this is his Hitchcock movie. Certainly the ending of Secret Defense, which is absolutely brilliant and brilliantly played by Sandrine Bernard, really is uh, a nod, I think, to Hitchcock, perhaps even to Claude Chabrol, one of Rivette's uh, nouveau vague uh, 
compatriots back in the late 50s and early 60s. And uh, as I say, there's four, there's three other Brevet films. I had a hard time choosing between them. Uh, the one flaw here is the commentaries by Richard Pena, which, uh, um, uh, which are probably the four, <laughs> I would put them in the four disappointing, uh, he does the commentary in all four films, and they are the most disappointing commentaries of the year. You really don't have to listen to these because, or at least past the first 20 or 30 minutes. Now we'll go to Fox Searchlight, and this is Park Chan-wook's Stoker. And this surprised me, too. I did this as part of the Nicole Kidman um, uh, series of uh, three films. Uh, I hadn't expected much from this because its reputation, I guess, is not good. Mia Wachikowska, this is really her movie, and Nicole Kidman was the supporting player along with Matthew Good. And it's only, it's uh, Park's only, his only English language feature film. He did do The Little Drummer Girl, a miniseries with Florence Pugh from the Jean Le Carré novel. Um, but as of, as of today, this is the only English language um, film and that he has made and I just I was hypnotized by this movie I mean this is just uh, we t I've talked about Hitchcock in this uh, series and definitely this is this is definitely uh, part one of Park's many many uh, 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 references to Hitchcock there's many references within the film uh, decision to leave was another I was thinking should I do decision to leave which was a 2022 film that uh, Park made his most recent film, I believe, because that's really his Vertigo film. Uh, this is uh, this is his Shadow of a Doubt film because this is an uncle and a niece, and they're very, very unusual and strange relationship. Uh, there's every shot in this film, as with Hitchcock, as with Orson Welles, every shot in this film is just something to look at. <laughs> and I love that kind of filmmaking. And again, we have an enclosed environment. I'm also very fond of enclosed environment. There are exteriors in this film, but certainly all the great scenes here, or many of the, most of the great scenes, come in the interplay between these three characters as they sort of uh, do a little dance around each other as to who, who, is, who are these people. They're difficult to read, as they always are. People always are difficult to read in Park Chan Wook's films, and uh, I think that this one really stunned me. Is how much I, how absorbing I found it from the very, the very first sequence. So now we're going to go to 2022, and this is a different kind of surprise. This is a surprise in which I saw a movie. I saw this movie in the theater when it came out. When one of the last movies I saw in the theater, and I really liked it. Uh, but, you know, I like movies in the theater. I get, you know, you, you have to be a really poor movie for me not to get absorbed in a movie, in a, in a movie theater. And so, but, and it was very weird. It felt difficult to digest. And if you've seen Triangle of Sadness, you know what I mean about difficult to digest. <laughs> and, and I was only, and I wasn't going to buy this because I thought, yeah, I just saw it in the movies. What do I need this as a criterion? And, uh, but when I got it and I watched it, I was just, I, I, this is one of the few movies I actually liked more when I saw it at home than I did, and I liked it out there. This is gonna, I think this might be, this might turn out to be a modern classic of the, of the 2020s. Uh, from Ruben Oslan, Osland, and I have seen, his other films are very strange, and this is very strange as well. Uh, Charlie, Charles B. Dean. Uh, plays the um, the lead actress here, and she tragically passed away, I think, before the film actually opened, of a very mysterious and quick illness. And she's terrific in here. The whole cast is terrific. It's an, uh, mostly an ensemble piece, um, and it, it 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 really is a haunting film. And and Ausland, and I like the way it changes it through the film when we, we do actually have sort of a chapter, so it's like this is a story and then we come to another story, another story with, with basically the same characters that goes into Admiral Crichton territory. <laughs> and uh, one thing that this has done, it has gotten me to notice the triangle of sadness, which is these lines right here <laughs> on a person's face. And they, they're not always a triangle, they're more, more or less 
parallel lines. But I, always, I always, whenever I, I watch a YouTuber, especially when I watch YouTubers, uh, but also actors on the screen, I, I try to discover what they're trying, what 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 uh, shape they're they're uh, this triangle of sadness that that is uh, explained. This is actually the this title is explained uh, thusly in the film, uh, but uh, really a, a terrific film, and that would will top off the year of 2023. So I've got one more video, possibly uh, coming on books, uh, and but that'll come after Christmas, so for those who celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas, and for everybody, Happy Holidays.